Welcome back to Critical Thinking, Analysis of Materials to Combat Climate Change. In part six, we look at what it would take, the speed of transition considering mandated markets or subsidized, incentivized schemes to tackle the major issues now instead of later. If there's a time factor and cost to go, how realistically, if we went all on board and we were able to convince people to get all excited <laughs> about this, uh -huh. what we're talking a time frame here that is let's go a bit conservative realistic well a new lithium project from start to finish oh and, and yeah. be aware be aware there's a bunch of them in process so some of that time has been has been yep. burned already but a new lithium mine start to finish because it's it's an involved task to try to generate pure lithium at battery grade it's not just digging something out of the ground throwing it on there and saying hey we're done you're talking about a decade. All the environmental studies, all the rest that are required, and believe me, they should be required. I'm not. I'm not suggesting that we somehow streamline this. Yep. It requires a decade. A new uranium mine, in most jurisdictions, either won't get built at all, or it'll take 15 years. Because again, there's there's an even bigger environmental hurdle to get over. But that assumes something, Andrew. That assumes that there are willing investors out there to back this project. Yes. The problem you have in a lot of critical materials markets is there's that added risk. I mean, these things are tiny markets. The demand side is not proven, right? We don't know that everyone is going to be buying an electric vehicle by a certain date. Yes. We don't know what lithium demand will be. We don't know if the Chinese will actually complete all the reactors they're saying, yep. or that North America will bid more or whatever else. Those markets have, never mind the regular mining risk, which is we might be wrong about the mineability of this asset. We might end up with a resource that can't be economically converted to a mine. Yep. We might end up with environmental problems. We might end up with political problems in, in terms of the jurisdiction it's in. We might end up with market issues in that maybe too many mines came to market at once. But you have this other factor, which is maybe the demand just isn't there at all. Yes, yes. That pushes investment away. And so one of the things that I would love to see from governments that are themselves convinced that this transition is happening, this is all going to occur, is, and these are relatively small markets, let's keep this in mind. This yes. is not iron ore, this is not aluminum, okay? Yeah. I would love to see the government step forward and say, we will buy it from mining companies. Yes. I will, you know, as a, gov as a government, will issue a purchase order, an offtake agreement to you for up to this amount of material at market prices that pertain. Yeah. And that would remove a significant chunk of the risk for at least a few projects. The ones that are selected through this, through this first process, at least they can go to the banks and to investors and say, here's my purchase order yes. from the national government. They're going to take my material if I get it into production. I'm one of only three companies that are doing this. They've capped it, and we're going to come into production to supply them. Now, if we can sell it to the broader market, they're happy, you know, and maybe they go out and they commission another project yes. to come into the space later, or maybe they don't. But at least that risk is gone. Now I can arrange debt financing because I have a good off taker. I can arrange, I can arrange equity financing because the risk is substantially reduced and equity investors don't like risk unless it's accompanied by ridiculous return. Yeah. Even then they tend to shy away from risk. So by reducing that risk, you make this a more tractable investment. And then we have the supply to go actually, to actually go do things. To pull up like a real life example, <laughs> we see, uh, you know, Canada uh, initiating this small modular reactor in Ontario. Great. Okay, great. This is great. Um, you know, I'm sure you probably, like myself, would rather have seen, let's do five or let's do eight or let's do 10. But okay, we get one. All right. Well, that is kind of exciting for the uranium market. But at the same time, Cameco goes, okay, well, maybe we can 
well, just mine a bit more. It, it doesn't necessarily mean we need to like continue with another mine. We could actually just use what we've got. Um, and is that mixed signal kind of like, listen, don't stick your toe in the water. Let's just like go for it. Incentivize the markets, you know, send a, a direct signal that you're doing this. Would that help? I, I, I think it would help, Andrew. And, and obviously, one modular reactor more or less isn't going to incent Cameco to open a new mine. I no. mean, like, that, 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 that isn't happening. But I worry a little bit. I worry a little bit that there aren't enough systems thinkers in government. People who, who are cross-disciplinary, who understand a bunch of the different issues facing it, the, uh, facing us in, in dealing with these problems, yeah. but also understand the interrelatedness of a lot of these different sectors in contributing to this. So, for example, I, I published something recently that talks about the looming, I mean, we're already in it, but there, there's a far worse uranium shortage that's about to afflict the world assuming all of the reactors in China that they're building are completed. And believe me, with, with the desire to reduce the number of coal plants in operation from an environmental point of view, the electricity shortages we've already seen for the last while in China, there is no incentive for the Chinese not to complete those nuclear plants and yeah. put them online. We know we're going to come into a very significant uranium shortage over the next few years. Now that's obviously going to raise prices. It's going to incent Cameco and Kazakhstan to bring all of their production back online. It's going yeah. to alleviate to some degree. One of the things that I don't think governments understand is most of these modular reactors are built to be start them and forget them. In other words, I take this modular reactor, I install the fuel, I cover it with dirt and I walk away. Yeah. And it produces electricity for its design period, whether that's 15 years, 20 years, 25 years, who cares? The problem is this, that reactor is small. It's less efficient than it would be if it were large. So yep. it requires a little more uranium per generated amount of electricity, but it's also loaded with 25 years worth of fuel or 20 years or 15. Conventional reactors get refueled. They're built so that they contain a limited amount of fuel on day one and more fuel is added on, on a periodic basis every once in a while. If we're coming into a uranium shortage, do we really want to stress a technology that front end loads our fuel demand? Yes. I leave that for the politicians because apparently they're much more clever than I am. But again, I think they're asking for a loaves and fishes solution yeah. to this. I'm not sure it exists in the uranium space. And I think one of the things that's been frustrating to me, and I'm sure to you as well, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but is the, some of this mixed messaging that we'd get. Yeah. And I don't mean from the activists, but from the government. You know, to me, I've been waiting for a signal from them, not only to incentivize, but, and, and it's happened, but it's, it's, I mean, this is years down the line. Uh, I, I'm sure you would have said, if we want to start really tackling by two, 20, 2022, we should have been having this conversation in 2015 and we'd yeah. be, we'd be now ta tackling this very well. Um, and it does. And once again, it doesn't mean that we don't start, we start applying things right now as we go. Uh, and this is where the interrelation of the politics and this and that become very difficult because we have this uh, BRICS relationship coming together. If China says, we'll just go straight to Kazakhstan. We don't need you the West. And that further causes a divide. Maybe it helps the environment. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe it causes other problems, but there's, there seems to be a breakdown in messaging between a lot of what would be well-intended and can be done. And perhaps it is, they're just not the right people to get it done. Uh, you know, that's could be it. I, you know what, Andrew, I, I was, I was going to say, I don't think there's any mixed messaging coming out of the activists because most of what's coming out of the worst examples of the activists is simple noise. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the idea that society bad, carbon dioxide bad, we need to change things. When, yeah. when I see somebody standing up in front of a fairly august collection of, you know, world leaders and lambasting them for what they're not doing, the obvious next thing that popped into my mind as a scientist is, so tell me what I should do. 
Mm -hmm. If you have no message other than you're bad and you're going to screw up my planet, what is your proposed alternative? Yes. I mean, people, if you told most of the people in society that we could start making a bit of a difference now, but it's pretty much an insurmountable problem. And, you know, to solve it, we're probably going to have to destroy the world anyway and collapse society with everyone going to live in an unheated yurt in the Canadian prairie in the winter. Um, I think most of them will say, well, then we're just going to party like it's 1999 until the world ends anyway. I yeah. mean, why would we why would we change things to our detriment immediately when we can watch things change to our detriment over 50 years? I mean, it's a, it's a simple question. Yeah. And yes, there's that mixed messaging component coming out of government. On the one hand, everything's simple, just drive an electric car and we'll build a few more wind turbines. On the other hand, boy, is this problem difficult and it's going to take us 50 to 100 years to solve it. Yeah. Neither one of those is true. I mean, I have laid out a plan, which we're going to discuss over a few of these. And it involves simple things. Yes, continue what we're doing with vehicles because we're already doing it. So why not? That will have an effect over many years of maybe a 5 to 7% reduction in global carbon. If, if we take the, the added step of really emphasizing and pushing hybrid electric vehicles and plug-in hybrid electric vehicles as government mandated or government subsidized or government supported or whatever else alternatives. Yes. Then there's the issue of replacing coal everywhere we can as rapidly as we can with natural gas where it's possible because that can be done on a relatively short basis or nuclear, something baseload. If you've got geothermal, God bless, plug it in. But yep. you know, additional large scale hydro plants in North America, probably are not going to get permitted and built. I no. mean, we built those. So let's get on that. And again, that's a government function to want to push that forward. It's not a market driven function to uproot those today, but we need to do it as soon as possible. If we do that in jurisdictions like China and other places, and everybody around the world is working to support this effort as much as is necessary, because it benefits all of us. And not only... Not let's say if uranium mined in Saskatchewan could be shipped to China to guarantee that a large number of coal fired power plants would get shut down, who doesn't win? Yes. In calculation. Yeah. There's more jobs in Saskatchewan. There's construction jobs and 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 economic growth in China, and the air gets cleaner worldwide. This is bad. Why? Yes. And we should be pushing that. That could have up to a 15 or 20% impact globally on carbon emissions.